benches away. If you want to take a look around, check out the flags. There is a lot of wood badge history in this building. Quite a bit of quite a bit of history here. Uh, wood badge is done here um, since the late 1940s. Okay, which is considered uh, kind of the first American wood badge. And uh, this lodge used to have a lot more flags in it. It had any place where there was space, there was a flag, including hanging from the rafters. But a number of years, they basically took those out. Uh, there were bats behind some of the uh, uh, behind some of the flags, and they felt that that was a health hazard. At least uh, that's what I heard at the time. What I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about the history of wood badge. Uh, you know, we all know where Woodbadge started back in England with Baden Powell. And you know, everybody kind of knows the story. You've all been through Woodbadge. Um, I'm sure you've been to Woodbadge meetings and heard the story. But uh, Woodbadge uh, was a little slow to start in the United States. It turned out that the Brits were always interested in, in getting Woodbadge started in the United States. And so in 1922, Francis Gidney, and you may have heard that name before, he was the first uh, uh, camp chief of Gilwell, and he came to the United States for a visit. And he talked about Gilwell, and he went to a number of different places, but, and he was, a, he was a pretty popular guy. But uh, he was more popular as an entertainer, not an educator. So Woodbatch didn't really get started back then. And it really took Baden Powell to visit the United States and to go to the Chef Scout Reservation to really plant the seed. And he visited here in uh, 1935. And it turns out, and a lot of people may not know this, but there were actually a couple of wood badge courses that were done in 1936 at Shift Scout Reservation. Okay? And uh, at that time, uh, and, and anybody that's in the OA knows the name E. Erner Goodman. Mm -hmm. E. Erner Goodman was tasked with setting up those two wood badge courses. Okay? They were done at Shift. A lot of people don't necessarily consider those the, the kind of the birth of American wood badge because it turns out that uh, uh, Don Skinner Wilson, who was the camp chief at uh, Gilwell, actually came over with the assistant camp chief, and both of them were the ones that ran the courses. So the courses were very British. Uh, the British did lectures. And... Uh, John Skinner Wilson really did wood badge exactly the way that it was done in England. And it was all lecture, no discussion, no, no chance for people to participate in the discussion. And that was it. The other thing that was uh, kind of interesting about that course was uh, they used uh, English recipes. Okay, and I think a lot of Americans aren't necessarily fond of a lot of boiled meat. Okay, so that was a problem, and because of that, uh, some people considered that a failure, uh, but it actually wasn't a failure because that really set the spark of wood badge among some people. It turns out that uh, the, the first one, there were two of them, and they were done almost simultaneously. The first one was May 12th through the 20th of 1936, and it was a rover wood badge. Rover in England is for advanced scouting. So they did a rover wood badge and they did a boy scout wood badge. And uh, the patrol names they used were the Burnham Patrol, the Lewis and Clark Patrol, and the Kemo Wilder Patrol. Anybody familiar with those names? I mean, I've heard of the names, but never in a wood badge contest. Uh, so anyway, uh, they did both those courses and uh, it did set the spark of wood badge and people, but it turns out that this was in 1936. Well, you all know what happened after that. The war started. So that kind of put that on the back burner. Um, let me see. The first really American wood badge course was done at Shift Scout Reservation uh, in 1948. Shift Scout Reservation is in New Jersey. And a lot of people consider that sort of the place for uh, wood badge. Uh, the camp chief of uh, Gilwell at the time, his name was John Thurman, was really anxious to try to bring wood badge to the United States. And also, at that time, there was a new chief scout executive. His name was Dr. Albert Fretwell, and he was a pretty keen guy on training. So he decided that uh, they ought to try that experiment, and they did that. But he had to be shown. And a lot of people figured that if they were going to do that wood badge course, it had to be successful for wood badge to really take in the United States. And uh, 
So they decided to do two courses that year. One was at the Sheskow Reservation, the other one was here at Philmont. But it wasn't here at Zastro. As a matter of fact, it was at Simran Cito. Okay? And the problem with Simran Cito was it's about 8,000 feet in altitude. It was cold. It was rainy. It snowed. It sleeted. It was a long way from the commissary, and communication was poor. But that course actually uh, was successful, and it was an American-run course by Americans the way we did scouting. The problem with the one in 1936 was it was done the British way, and that's really not how we did scouting in the United States. Even though we had the scouting program, there were differences in the scouting program. So what they did was they covered uh, basic scout requirements from tenderfoot to first class, uh, patrol activities from the handbook for patrol leaders, activities from the handbook for scout masters, and advanced scout craft from the new scout field book. And, uh, that the emphasis on that course was on doing and not lecturing. So it was a hands-on course and that's one of the reasons that it was successful. It was, uh, the, the courses were nine days. Uh, let's see, the one at, uh, let, let, let me tell you a few specifics about the course, okay? Turns out that the SPL for that course, or the, excuse me, the Scoutmaster, was uh, Ray Marville. And Green Barville was able to do that because he went through the course in 1936 and he had his beads from that course. And that was a requirement for somebody to be the scoutmaster for the course. Uh, I'm going to tell you a few things and tell me if these sound familiar. The patrol names were Eagle, Bob White, Fox, and Beaver. Good. All right. Uh, the patrol leaders rotated responsibility every day and there was a patrol leaders conference on a daily basis. They sang back to Gilwell. Okay. Uh, they made homemade patrol flags. They had an unsupervised uh, uh, outing away from uh, Gilwell. Uh, the kudu horn was the program uh, patrol totem and the camp spade was the service patrol totem. And if you take a look up here, see all the spades? Okay, there's a lot of history here. Uh, they did rotation of staff and guests for meals. The staff did an ideal troop meeting. I hope ours was ideal. Uh, a campfire and participants were to outdo the staff. They had evening cracker barrels. There was a feast and a closing ceremony. Sound familiar? This was back, remember, 1948. Okay. Uh, there were 29 participants from 12 states by invitation of the Chief Scout Executive. There was six staff. How many staff on your work badge course? I think we've kind of grown staff-wise, right? And I'm just wondering if that's where all wood badgers go to staff courses. Uh, but they had a Scoutmaster and SPL, two special assistants, a scribe and a quartermaster, and that was it. Okay? Uh, let's see, that was the first wood badge course, that was at Schiff Scout Reservation. The second course was done here at Philmont, it was also a nine day course. It was done from October 2nd to October 10th of uh, 1948. And again, to six staff there. And I already talked about the issues with uh, weather and so forth, uh, but a lot of the feedback that came from the participants was, it was a mountaintop experience. Okay? Four courses were held in 1949, uh, in addition to the one at Schiff and the one at Philmont. Where do you think the one in 1949 was done? Yeah. When was this cabin built? 1949. So this cabin has been here since 1949, and it's always been wood badge until in the middle of the 2000s, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. The invitations for the course were sent by the Chief Scout Executive, and uh, just a little beyond that, by 1958 there was almost 5,000 participants who had gone through Wood Badge. Uh, there was a little over uh, 3,000 people that received their beads. Were the Wood Badges at that point only held here? No, they were held in different places, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's a good question. Remember, I said there were four courses beside the one that was done here at Schiff, in the one, or at Philmont and the one that was done in Schiff in 1949. Uh, and, and it's funny you ask because basically a lot of people started getting really interested in wood badge and as the demand grew, the obvious question was, 
can count local councils do a course? And of course the answer was yes. And so the first local council wood badge course was run in the Cincinnati area, later the Dan Beard Council, in the summer of 1953. And there were also courses that were held in the Baltimore Area Council, the Greater New York Council, Los Angeles Council, Middle Tennessee Council, Philadelphia, and the San Francisco County Council. And since 1953, there's been a lot of local council courses, and I'm sure we've all attended those. From the very beginning of Wood Badge, there was a volunteer training service that was set up at National. So there was one group that basically administered the courses uh, at National. So every course that was taught was Wood Badge something. They were numbered sequentially. The first one at Shift was Wood Badge 1. The second course at Cimarron Cedo was Wood Badge 2. Okay. They also directed National Camp Schools. They assisted local councils in helping them with their training. Uh, and basically they had, uh, at the time, they wrote two staff guides. One was for National, which was really designed for train the trainer, and the other one was for the local councils. Then, something happened in the 60s, which had a really profound effect on Wood Badge. As a matter of fact, and we were just talking about this last night at dinner, uh, there, there was an entity called White Stag. And White Stag was uh, several dedicated scouters in the Monterey Area Bay Council had been involved in research and development on leadership uh, processes uh, for, the, for the military. And so what they did was they uh, put together a training course for young men to teach them how to be leaders. And people saw this and they, saw, and they thought this was a really good idea, so there was a lot of interest in that. And so, People did some uh, examination, people came to White Stag and looked at the course, and uh, basically what they did was they transitioned that, those leadership principles into uh, Wood Badge. And this is pretty significant because the Wood Badge that I went to in 1986 was based on those 11 skills of leadership. Okay? And it was that way until the early 2000s when we went to Wood Badge for the 20th century. So there were a number of experimental courses, and uh, there was also a junior leader development uh, portion of the program that began in 1969, and uh, was called Troop Leader Development, and later called Troop Leader Training Conference, and later called the Junior Leader Training Conference, which I was involved in, I did a number of those, okay? And uh, so they experimented with this process for about five years, and then in 1972, uh, they cast that in concrete, and that was done from 1972 on, okay? And it really involved 11 skills of leadership, and they were communicating, knowing and using the resources of the group, understanding the characteristics and the needs of the group, planning, controlling group performance, effective teaching, representing the group, evaluating, sharing leadership, counseling, and setting the example. How many people went to one of those wood badge courses in here? Okay. Uh, and let me tell you what, and I've talked to a number of people, that course was an epiphany for me. I started scouting in 1984, I went through wood badge in 1986, and the thing that was so profound for me was the fact that not only was that for scouting, but it was for everything. The Boy Scouts of America got a lot of feedback saying, this is great stuff because it helped me get a raise, it helped me get promoted, it helped me in my church life, it helped me in my company, it helped me at home, and that's the thing that was really my epiphany. If I wouldn't have gone through that course in 1986, I would never have done what, I, what I'm doing today. And so that's really what got me started. And I was able to go to Wood Badge two years after, uh, <clears throat> two years after I started uh, scouting. The difference is, in that course was, actually, leadership was done in that course by design. There were 11 skills of leadership. You did, an, you did a practical phase and an application phase. You wrote a ticket. You had anywhere from six months to two years to complete your ticket. And one of the things that you had to do when you were working on your ticket is you had to specifically use those leadership skills when you, when you wrote your ticket. I'm going to do this, and how am I going to use these leadership skills? I'm going to use these leadership skills to do this. 
So it was by design where the courses before really were all about teaching scout craft and also training the trainer. Uh, let me see. So uh, back in 1979, after this started, they also wrote two staff guides. And the reason they did that is because it's really hard for people to take off a week and go to a week-long course. So what they did was they wrote a staff guide for a week course, and they wrote one for a weekend course. I went to the weekend course. It was three weekends, and that's how I was able to do that. A lot of people just can't afford to take that much time off, and they really wanted people to, uh, uh, to be able to go to Woodbash. So what happened in, around 2000? Now, all the trainings changed. Using the 21st century national has changed everything. Right. And here's some of the reasons they did that. One of, the, one of the reasons they wanted to do that was because they wanted to look at current leadership principles. You know, there's a lot of leadership principles that are out there, and when they started doing that, they based a lot of that on Stephen Covey. You all know who Stephen Covey is? Or was. He passed away here a while back. Uh, Stephen Covey wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So they uh, started using some of that, but the problem was they had to pay royalties for that. And so what they did was they kind of wrote that out. But what they wanted to do was to take a look at current leadership uh, principles and try to integrate those into wood badge. The second reason they did that was because there were a lot of wood badge courses that were developing their own culture. And by developing their own culture, what they were doing is they were getting away from the mission of teaching people leadership and they were concentrating on other things. And I know there was one course where they gave you a live chicken, you had to kill the chicken, pluck it, and that was your day. You know, what does that have to do with leadership skills? So there was some of that stuff that was going on, and that's one of the reasons they changed it also. Um, and the other reason they changed it was because at the time uh, that they did that, there was only Boy Scout Wood Badge, and there was a Cub Leader Training Wood Badge that I think started around 1976, okay? And that was a train the trainer. So they wanted to be able to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to go, whether they were Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Venturers, whatever. And that, those are some of the reasons that they changed it. And we've been doing that uh, ever since. Now this building right here was used, and in 1974, because there were so many wood badge courses in the United States, that volunteer training service, which was a national entity, uh, actually the control of wood badge courses went to the regions. Okay? Uh, because there were so many wood badge courses, and that group could not take care of all the administration and the planning and the, uh, and the execution of wood badge. So then the control of that went to the regions. And uh, for a couple of years, this building wasn't used. As a matter of fact, around 74, 75, this building wasn't used. And then in 1976, a thing happened here, and they started a program called Walking Wood Badge. Walking Wood Badge was no different than any other Wood Badge course from the standpoint of the leadership principles, but it was a little bit different because what we did was it was a modified track that went into the backcountry. And what they did was they taught Wood Badge on the trail. Okay, now, can you imagine walking around on the trail with a big flip chart? Well, we didn't take flip charts. Uh, what they did was they had a staff guide that was probably a little bit smaller than this. It was in a uh, four by six notebook. And everything that was in the staff guide for a week-long course was in that little book. And that book was big enough for you to put into your pocket. And the scout craft skills part of that came in the fact that it was a trek through film on so what we would do is we would uh, go hiking, and then periodically, if we were teaching one of those leadership skills, we would stop, pull off the trail, the coach counselor would sit with the patrol, and they would go through a discussion. Now, the interesting thing about that is it wasn't lecture. It was a discussion. So the people that were on the staff of that course really had to be good and being able to facilitate a discussion. And that's basically how you got on the wood badge staff. If you were good at facilitating discussions and getting people to teach themselves and being able to direct that conversation, then you were a good facilitator. Okay, and, uh, and then in the evening, the whole troop would meet at a certain place and we would do troop presentations. Ethical decision making, some of the other things that were involved in Wood Badge at the time. 
Uh, and what we did was we started from uh, Zastro. We went up through Abreu, hiked up, uh, up, up the hill and went through the notch and basically followed the contour to Fish Camp and went through Fish Camp and then up the Agua Fria, uh, up the hill to Lost Cabin, then to Apache Springs, then over to uh, Crooked Creek, down to PJ, to Bogan, and then down to Lower Benita. So that was a pretty, pretty large uh, trek that we did. Okay? I, I was very fortunate to be able to uh, come to Philmont in 1988 uh, and started with Walking Wood Badge 13, which was SC353. Um, and I, I did Wood Badge from 88 to 94. 88 was also a special year because it was the 50th anniversary of Philmont. And uh, I can tell you right now that those courses were probably the highlight of my scouting career. Uh, they were magical and, uh, you know, I was so fortunate to be able to do that. So I did seven walking wood badge courses and in 1994 I directed SR99 because uh, in between the time that I started and I finished, uh, the Boy Scouts of America went from six regions to four regions. Okay, so the walking wood badge 13 was SE353. My last course, the administration of that course went to the southern region and it was SR99. And uh, we had 64 people that went through that course. I don't know if you know anybody that went through Walking Wood Badge. Um, if you see uh, at, Rock, at uh, Riata Ridge, it's the Zakara Leadership uh, Lodge. Dan Zakara went through Wood Badge, Walking Wood Badge in 1988. And that's where I first met him. So it was a great program. There is a lot of history in here. There's a lot of flags. Uh, there's a lot of pictures. When we got done, just put up the benches, take a, take a look around, uh, see some of the things that are in here, but it was, uh, it was an awesome experience. I've been gifted to be able to do what I've done, okay? And uh, certainly, it was my pleasure to be on Walking Wood Badge, because that was uh, probably one of the most special activities I went through in Scotty. Okay? But my last course that I did was 1994. Perfect. I know keys there. It looks like you have a brass. Is that from a wood badge course? Which one? On your keys, on your left side. These? Is that brass round circle from a wood badge? No, it's actually my truck number. Bob, <laughs> <laughs> okay. can, I, can I add on just sure. a little bit? Uh, I knew when I first came back into scouting as a volunteer about 1993, I knew there was two things I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Philmont and I wanted to go to wood badge. And I found out about Walking Wood Badge. And I signed up for Walking Wood Badge and ended up having to withdraw from that course and uh, move to Kentucky to another job. I thought that was a program that would continue on at Philmont. And when they talked to me about refund, I said, just roll it over to next year. And they said that was the last Walking Wood Badge that was going to happen. The paperwork that I received and still have in a file at home was from course director Bob Longoria. Now, when I moved to Kentucky, one of my scouting mentors uh, was a gentleman named James Kinder. I told you about him with the uh, Augie Augie Oi uh, cheer the other day. James went through Walking Wood Badge 16 with Bob. So, you know, this last year I came back down here at, with the pack that I bought for Walking Wood Badge, whatever the last one was. And Bob and I and that pack came together finally 20 years later right here at Zastro. And the reason I wanted to share that with you is as wood badgers, you have no idea how far your reach will be. And Bob's went basically around the world in 20 years and has been a huge impact in my life indirectly until I got here and met this gentleman last year and I'm fortunate enough and honored to call him my friend, my hero, and one of my mentors. And ditto to you. <laughs> uh, just, just a couple more things about this building. Uh, 1994 was the last year the walking wood badge was done here. But there were static courses that actually did wood badge here for a few years. Um, the last Frontier Council out of Oklahoma City, and if you take a look at these pictures, you'll see a lot of the pictures are from Oklahoma City. They did a static course here, and also, uh, Circle 10 did courses here. And they did those uh, up until about 2000. 
As a matter of fact, 2000 was the last year a static course was done. It was the last Frontier Council. Uh, so the building, this building was only used for wood bears. Today, it's not. It's a staff camp. And the reason that it's a staff camp is because Belmont wanted to expand their program and the building wasn't being used for wood badge. Because by 2000, the wood badge courses started being done at Rocky Mountain Scout Camp. And now, like uh, the wood badge course that's going to be here next week, they're going to be done up at Rayado Ridge. So what they did around the middle part of uh, 2000, they turned this into a staff camp. Okay? Uh, and what they do here, what they did here this year is uh, scout rededication. They did Dutch Ubler, Dutch oven cobbler uh, competitions to see who could make the best Dutch oven cobbler. They also did uh, geocaching and they did, I know you're going to go, ah, ATV. Okay? They did an ATV program uh, up in the meadow going up toward uh, uh, Carson Meadows. And the reason they did that was because it's mainly going to be for uh, safety. Okay? I know Philmont's not the best place to do ATVs, and we all understand that. But uh, we are where we are. So this place now is a staff camp. There was a staff here this year. And from now on, all the Philmont Leadership Challenge courses are going to be coming here and spending the night. The one during the summer in July came here. It was the first Philmont Leadership Challenge course that uh, came up here during the summer. And consequently what we did, and that was uh, uh, Sherry Moravec was the course director, and uh, what we did was we took the, the picture of the group, and because of the connection between Wood Badge and the Philmont Leadership Challenge, that picture right there is that course. And that's the only picture that's going to be in here, because Wood Badge's home is really at Rayado Ridge, it's not here. But that picture is here because of the connection between Wood Badge and the Philmont Leadership Challenge. And, and when we told the participants that, they were so overjoyed, it was amazing. Okay, where's Sherry? Mm -hmm. Sherry, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> what are they happy about that? <laughs> okay, they were really happy about that, right? And, and it was a marvelous course, just like your course is. And so we wanted to make that connection, so we brought this picture up and put it up here. And that's the only picture that will be here. Because of the connection, not because the Philmont Leadership Challenge home is here. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more of a feel for what this building is. So, yes, sir. Yeah, why did Walking Wood Badge stop and go to okay. the static course? All right. <laughs> You're going to make me tell the whole story. I want the whole story, Bob. Actually, it, it's not really complicated. Um, in part, Walking Wood Badge was kind of their own worst enemy in a way, for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, when I did my course in 1994, almost everybody on that course was a 4 beat Wood Badger. Okay? I did seven of those courses. I was part of the problem. Uh, we stayed probably too long being on the course, and there were a lot of people that wanted to come and staff this course that weren't able to do that. And, th and some of those people had some power. And the other thing is, is that the coordinator for this program was, he was kind of a crusty old guy, and he probably got in bad with some of those people also. So in 94, they dropped the course. It was the only course at that time that was done not in a local council. 1994, every Wood Badge course was done in a local council, except for Walking Wood Badge. Walking Wood Badge was administered out of the southern region, and the course number was SR-99. As an aside, I was the course director on my council the year before, and that course was WE5-412-93. So you can see the difference in the region numbering, which I thought was kind of interesting. I never liked that long one. But then, it wasn't my decision. Okay? I just went with the flow. So anyway, uh, anybody have any other questions? I was going to say, it might be probably like the first year back here that we <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's a good try. <laughs> but we kind of already made that decision. And the camp director here that was here this summer was gracious enough to allow us to come up here and put that in. It, it was a good friend of ours. And what he did was he tried to preserve the wood badge part of this, even though this camp does other things. So when you walk around and look at it, there's still a lot of wood badge stuff here. There's a lot of pictures here uh, of wood badge courses that go way back. 
Uh, you know, uh, here's one that was Web Badge 358. That was a national course because national courses were numbered sequentially, W, B, and then the, and then the course number, which was a sequential number. When uh, those courses went to the region, they changed the numbering system. And now everybody's got a different numbering system. Okay? And I'm sure when you went through your wood badge course, you got some kind of a funny number. Didn't they standardize them a couple years ago? Uh, you know, they try to do it, but there's still people that kind of sneak in a different number. Okay, I won't tell you who, but I know some people have done that. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah, I hope that was kind of illuminating and it gives you a feel for the history that's here. I mean, this place has incredible history. There was a lot of wood badges that were done here and there were mostly national courses. Those national courses ended about 1974 when the administration of wood badge went to the regions. Bob, would you also tell us about the significance of the axe and log out here? Yeah, that axe and log was donated to the DSA in 1950. Uh, to commemorate 40 years of scouting in the United States. It sat at Schiff Scout Reservation until Schiff closed in 1979, and when it closed, they moved that axe and log here to Philmont, and it's been here ever since. You notice the top of it's a little shiny? Make sure you go out there and put your mark on it, okay? Uh, because a lot of people have done that, and that's a lot of history. That, that, that axe and log has been in the United States since 1950. Uh, and I'm almost as old as it. <laughs> Actually, I'm probably older, but that's okay. All right. uh, so anyway, go ahead and move the benches, take a look around, take pictures, uh, see if you can find me in any of these pictures, I'm in a couple, maybe more than a couple. Thank you.